So, the next module, we will be talking about the fire safety. So, having a fire in a place is one of the most highly preventable situations if and only if we follow all the safety regulations and also if we use our common sense as well as our awareness in looking out for the possible fire hazards. Prevention and control of the fire hazards should always be a part of a safety program in each workplace and even in our own homes. So what is fire safety? When we say fire safety, it is the set of practices that intends to reduce destruction caused by fire. It also refers to planning and infrastructure design aimed at reducing the risk of fire or impeding the spread of a fire when one does break out. So, what is a fire? So, it is a chemical reaction between flammable or combustible material and oxygen. So this process, it converts the flammable or the combustible material and the oxygen into an energy. So to understand more, here is, we should know the fire triangle. So the fire triangle, it illustrates the elements necessary for a fire to start. So we have the oxygen, heat, fuel as its elements. So if these three are combined, a fourth element appears. So, if th there is a fourth element, it will no longer be a triangle. So, the fourth element, it will become the, it is the, the chain reaction itself. So, it is now called the fire tetrahedron. It is, the chain reaction is necessary for flame propagation. So, what is fuel? Fuel is any materials that will burn. So we have three types of fuel. We have the solid fuels, the liquid fuels, and the gaseous fuels. So some of the examples of the solid fuels, um, we use it commonly in our day-to-day -day lives as a, um, let's say, to start fire. So we have the wood, um, coal, peat, and for the liquid fuels, we have the kerosene oil, the petrol, for the gaseous, gaseous fuels, these are the CNG and the LPG. So, if you're wondering what this means, um, CNG means the compressed natural gases. The other is the liquefied petroleum gases. So, what is the difference between flammable and combustible substance? When we say flammable substances, um, it is a substance having a flash point below 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 37.8 degrees Celsius and vapor pressure not exceeding 20 PSIA at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So what is a flash point? So flash point is the lowest temperature at which fuel begins to give off flammable vapors and form an ignitable mixture of in, in air. So, as you can see in the table, we have the different flammable substances and its different and its different flash points in degree Fahrenheit and in degree Celsius. So, for example, we have the fuel oil. Fuel oil it has um, a negative forty-five degree Fahrenheit degree Fahrenheit as its flash point and negative forty-two point eight degree Celsius at its at its flash as its flash point. And so on. So, while the combustible substance, um, a combustible substance has a flash flash point at or above at or above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So, as you can see the difference, the flammable substances, it has a flash point below 100 degree Fahrenheit or 37.8 degrees Celsius, while the combustible, the flash point is at the at or above the 100 degree Fahrenheit or 37.78 in degrees Celsius. So here are the exam some examples for the combustible substances and its different flash points. So in fuel oil, it has 100 degree Fahrenheit 
and 37.8 degrees Celsius as its flash points. So, what is the oxygen? So, oxygen, it is needed in a fire because like humans, oxygen, I mean, fire also needs oxygen for it to, to completely burn. So, the, as we can see at the fire triangle, it always states that it really needs oxygen for it to build up. Sorry about that. So, heat. So, with, with, do, with those two combined, the, the fuel and the oxygen, it will not form a fire. Because we need the third element, which is the heat. So, a heat is a form of energy that can be transferred from one object to another. Or even create at the expense of the loss of other forms of energy. So, back to, from the oxygen, um, as you notice, when we are building fire outside the place, when we cook, um, if we put the uh, woods close to each other, um, we are finding hard times at starting the fire. Because It is because the oxygen cannot pass through and it, the fire will not build up. So, yeah. So... How to extinguish a fire? Extinguishing a fire is easy. We just, we just, um, let's just say this. We just base our, um, base it on the fire triangle. So first, we just remove the fuel. So by removing one element from the fire triangle, um, the fire cannot. I mean, the fire will be extinguished. So, removing fuel. Removing fuel is not so easy to do. But there are instances or examples that it can be done. So, example, um, in the stove. So, the fuel when we start the fire in the stove is the LPG gases. I mean the LPG. So, simply we just cut off or turn off the bulb. I mean turn off the LPG. So that the fire will be turned off easily. So that's how we can remove fuel. Another is in fire spires, the techniques used are firewalls or fire breaks. Next is removing oxygen. So in removing oxygen, um, oxygen cannot be eliminated completely or so what we can all, only do is to suffocate it so suffocating it from fire through smothering the burning area with a non-combustible material so for example um there is uh, as we can see in the movies right um if someone is if someone is getting caught by a fire um we see them um covering it with a blanket but it's not only an ordinary blanket because if it is only a ordinary an ordinary blanket, um, it can also catch fire. So they wet the blanket so that it they can I mean they can suffocate the fire. So next is to reduce the concentration concentration of oxygen below the concentration necessary to support combustion. So this can be accomplished by discharging carbon dioxide or other in inert gases into fire. Next is removing heat. So in removing heat, um, we simply reduce the heat below its flash point. So as I have mentioned earlier, the different flash points of the fuels, um, you just simply reduce the heat. So interacting the chain reaction. So, interrupting chain reaction, inhibiting the oxidation process, and the production of flammable vapors that react with oxygen, then we extinguish the fire. So, there are different kinds of fires um, from what materials are they made of. 
or what different flammable materials. So we have the class A fires. So class A fires are those fueled by materials that when they burn, they leave a residue in the form of ash, such as paper, wood, cloth, rubber, and certain plastics. Uh, next is the class B fire. So I mean, so in class A fires, it is basically the solid solid fuels. It, so in the class B fires, it involves flammable liquids and gases such as gasoline, paint thinner, kitchen grease, propane, and acetylene. We have the class C fire. So in class C fire, it involves energized electrical wirings or equipments such as motors, computers, panel boxes. In class D fires, it involves combustible metals such as magnesium, sodium, titanium, and certain organometallic compounds such as alkyl, lithium, and grignard reagents. Um, I have some, I have, I forgot something in the flashpoint. So, what do you think? In case you are wondering if what is more dangerous, having a high flashpoint or a lower flashpoint, um, the more dangerous is having a lower flashpoint because simply because. Having lower flashpoint meaning it can be easily light up or can catch up fire. So the, the more dangerous is the lower flashpoints. Okay, sorry about that. We also have a, the class K fire. So this is the last of all the classes. So fire that involves combustible cooking fuels such as vegetables or animal oils and fats so we have the principles of fire and prevention and control so first we can i mean in a we can prevent the outbreak of a fire so we prevent fire by preventing the combination of three elements at the right proportion so the most difficult element to Control is the oxygen, for it is necessary, I mean it is in the air and it's a necessity in life. So, we can, we can deal with the other two, the fuel, the fuel and the heat. So, we just simply, on how to control them, we just simply um, separate them from, from combining. So, Examining fire hazards around the place. So, as you can see in the table, based on the National Statistic, o Statistic Office 2007, the common cause of fires are this electrical, open flames. So, here it, we, can, we will talk about it in the next slide. So, common causes of fire we have the electricity. So, electrical faults which could cause fires and can be source of ignition in a potentially flammable or explosive atmosphere. So, how can we control this? It is so basic. So, we just, we can conduct regular inspection and maintenance of electrical installation. Um, by that, we can employ a trained and licensed electrician to do the, to inspect or in, to do the maintenance of electrical installations. And we should follow the Philippine Electrical Code and Occupational Safety and Health Standards. Next is we have the mechanical heat. Heated surface on furnaces, flues, heating devices, and light bulbs can cause fires if flammable or combustible materials are close enough to absorb sufficient heat to cause combustion. So we should take care I mean, care should be taken to ensure that all, all such devices are properly installed, especially with respect to clearance and barrier materials. So that's the only thing that, that's only how we can control the mechanical heat. Next is the friction sparks. So, friction generates heat. Oh, excessive heat generated by friction causes a very high percentage of industrial fires. So, 
fire usually results from overheated power transmission bearings and shafting from poor lubrication and excessive dust, the jamming of work material during production, incorrect tension adjustment of belt-driven machinery, if the belt is too tight or too loose, excessive friction could develop. So how can we control friction sparks? So preventive maintenance, as always, we should always have a maintenance program to keep bearings well oiled and do not run hot and keep accumulation of flammable dust or lint on them to a minimum. Also, we can keep oil holes of bearings covered to prevent dust and gritty substances from entering the bearings. So just like the other causes of fire, common causes of fire, we should always have um, uh, maintenance every now and or inspection of the materials every now and then to to secure uh, from to secure our safety. So next are the open flames. So the open flames is the careless disposal of cigarettes, pipe embers, and cigars that are major cause of fire. So open flames can be highly controlled because mostly it is a human error. So basically all we could do is to provide a no smoking area sign in a specific place at specified times where supervisions can be maintained. Um, we also can prohibit our employees from even bringing lighters, matches, or any smoking materials that can be that can be a cause of fire. So better safe than sorry. So we sh it's better to prohibit employees from even bringing those kind of hazards. So we have the spontaneous heat. So spontaneous heat is a an unconstrained start result from a substance response where there is a moderate age of warmth from oxidation of natural mixes that under specific conditions is quickened until the start temperature of the fuel is reached. So spontaneous heat. So it is the, for example, if there are large manure piles and it has a direct contact from the sun. So with enough time, over time, it's under the it uh, it has an, a direct contact with the rays of the sun. Um, over time, it can combust and create fire. So, most example of this are the light materials, because they can easily be they have low flash points, so they can easily be caught fire. Next is the welding and cutting sparks. Hazardous sparks such as globules of molten, burning metal or hot slug are produced by both welding and cutting operations. So how can it control? This work should not be done in a confined space, so basically we should not do it in a closed area, I mean, we should do it in an open space. So, um, bigger space, I mean, big, bigger space so that we can operate freely. And the sparks, I mean, the sparks of the welding and cutting cannot be, cannot go to, uh, cannot be caught by the few combustible or the flammable materials. So move combustibles a safe distance away. So ideally, um, 35 feet horizontally. So we should move this, we should move the flammable objects, ideally 35 feet horizontally. And protect the exposed combustibles with suitable fire resistant guards and provide a trained fire watcher with extinguishing equipment readily available. So we should cover with us uh, with maybe um, we can use a less flammable material to cover the so to cover the combustibles. So cover opening in walls, floors, or ducts should be within 35 feet of the work. And also we should implement hot work permit system. So hot work permit system. Um, if you you are working in a hot work, you should you should ask for permit. To, should ask ask permit to letting them know that you are working in a hot hot area. It is intended to assure that the individuals involved in the working place are aware of the hazards associated with hot work and welding. 
That's what I meant to say there, sorry. Next is the generation of static charge. Static electricity is electricity at rest. So, it is formed by the contact and separation of the similar materials. A source of static charge is the motion of fluids through a pipe or a hose. So, how can we control such th this thing, this the statistic static charge? So, bonding or bonding or grounding are key control measures for fire related to static electricity. Bonding is done to eliminate a difference in static charge potential between objects. The purpose of grounding is to eliminate the difference in static charge potential between an object and ground. Bonding and grounding are effective only when the bonded objects are conductive. So these are the examples of highly flammable or combustible materials. So as you notice, these are li more likely um, a light material. So example are hay and straw, as you can see in the picture. Bedding materials such as sawdust and shielded paper. The cobwebs also, the grain dust, and blankets and sheets. Um, paint is also a combustible material. Fertilizers, pesticides. So what is an accelerant? An accelerant is any, are any substances or mixture that accelerates or speeds the development of fire. So accelerants are usually used for arsons and some may cause explosions. So we have accelerants such as gasoline, kerosene, oil and aerosol cans. So ignition, ignition sources. So ignition sources is something that can cause the accelerant or flammable material to ignite or smolder. For example, for examples, uh, um, examples are cigarettes, matches, and lighters, the sparks from the welding machines, and also motors, heaters, electrical appliances, electrical wires and fixtures, batteries, and chemicals. Principle of fire prevention and control. So provide for B is to provide for early detection of fire. Except for explosions, most fires start as start out as small ones. So at the initial stage, extinguishing a fire seldom presents much of a problem. So ideally, um, we should we should put a fight fire um, within five minutes. So in that range of time, the fire is not too big. So we can fight it on our own we don't have to call for help i mean we don't have to call for the firefighters because we can only we can fix we can deal it with ourselves so but once the fire begins to gain headway it may develop into conflagration of disastrous proportions so this is the time maybe we can call for help of others most likely the firefighters so fire can be more easily controlled if detected early it is Critical that fire be extinguished in the first five minutes. So that's what I have said. So detection serves to warn the fire brigade to start in extinguishing. So it also warns occupants to escape. So early detection really helps because it warns all the occupants in the environment. And also we can start the extinguishing procedure earlier so means of detection include uh, human observer the human the people around the area the automatic sprinkler um, smoke flame and heat detectors so these are the these are smoke detectors so we commonly see this at um, we even have this in our school so mainly smoke detectors Monitors changes within the area. It provides early warning, changing stages in the development of fire. So when smoke is produced, it alarms. So we have heat detectors. Uh, yeah, I think I saw this in the mall. So 
fixed temperature types which respond when detection element reach a determined temperature. So it also has the rate of rise temperature which respond to an increase in heat at a rate greater than some predetermined value. So we have two different flame detectors, the infrared, infrared and the ultraviolet. So both sense elements responsive to radiant energy outside the range of human vision. Useful in detecting fire in large areas such as the um, example um, the storage areas. So prevent the spread of fire. So once a fire is discovered, it is of prime importance to confine it to the smallest area possible. Meaning, um, we should create barriers or maybe we should take away the flammables, flammables around, it, around the burning area so that it cannot spread. So this can be accomplished by details of construction and by safe practices, but neither is sufficient alone. An understanding of the means by which heat is transmitted would be of value in taking the necessary steps to prevent the spread of fire. There are three methods of heat transfer. First is the conduction. So conduction, it is a transfer of heat from molecule to molecule. For example, um, my, my colder hands, when I touch a hot water bottle, when I touch a hot water bottle, um, the heat transfer to my hands. So basically, the heat flows from the hotter object to the colder ones. So that's how conduction works. So convection, it is caused by movement of heated gases produced by any burning materials or by heated air rising to the upper limits of the space in which it is contained. During a fire in a building, convection currents convey combustion gases up through stairways or lift shafts spreading the fire to other parts of the building. So that's how um, fire spreads in the building. So if it is in the middle, in the mid floors, it can reach until up to the top because the fire is always going up. It can reach the ceiling. Next is the radiation. So it is the transfer of heat in a form of straight rays. The heat rays can be absorbed by the combustible materials which may cause to heat up and ignite. So this is the spontaneous heat uses the radiation as a method of heat transfer. So they, if you put them in the direct contact with the sun and in over time it will catch heat or may ignite. So how to control? So that's like what I said earlier, we need barriers. Barriers are one means of control that will limit the area of a fire or at least control its spread. So some examples of bar barriers are um, firewalls, um, fire doors. So firewalls, we can see this in many in buildings, different buildings in the cities because it is to prevent them from being, being to catch the fire from the other building. D is to provide for prompt extinguishment. So in providing prompt extinguishment, we should always keep in our minds the two categories of fire extinguishers. So that we have the permanent or built-in built -in extinguishers and the portable fire extinguishers. So the built-in or the permanent fire extinguishers are the standpipe and hose, the automatic sprinkler system fire hydrants, fire pump, fire trucks, automatic extinguishing system. So basically, it, uh, the permanent or built-in in fire, built fire extinguishers are the ones you cannot um, carry to other places. So the standpipe and hose, we can see this in a school. We have standpipes and the hose there. So we have the portable fire exting portable extinguishers. So Portable fire extinguishers are also called first aid fire extinguishers since they are 
intended to be used for incipient fires. There, these are used extensively to lessen the danger from fire. These appliances are designed for use on fires of specific classes. So, the, but the, there are different portable fire extinguishers because there are the, in di different. There are also different classes of uh, specific classes of fire to be put out. So this are uh, this is a picture of a portable fire extinguishers. In case you don't know. So requirements for effective use of fire extinguishers. Extinguishers. So. Siyempre, the, of the approved type, so, so must have a seal of PS mark for locally made and UL mark for imported ones. So, through this, of the approved type, we can know that this fire extinguisher is legit and is safe to use because it is it has marks from lo locals. Second is the right type for each class of fire that may occur in the area. So we must have um, the right extinguisher, portable extinguisher in the different hazard in a certain area. So third is the it should be in sufficient quantity. So the number of fire extinguishers must be computed, accor computed according, according, according to the floor area. The degree of hazard of fire that may occur and the class of fire. So fourth, so it should be located where they are easily accessible for immediate use, immediate use and the location is kept accessible and clearly identified. So as much as possible, um, we should label our um, fire extinguishers in the buildings so, so that we can so that everyone can have access of the portable fire extinguishers in case of fires. So fifth, mounting of fire extinguishers. Extinguishers with a gross weight not exceeding 18 kilograms or 40 pounds should be installed not more than 5 feet or 1.5 meters above the floor. So B is the Extinguishers with a gross weight greater than 18 kilograms or 14 pounds except wheel type extinguishers should be installed not more than 3.5 feet meter 3.5 meet or 1 meter above the floor so the heavier the fire extinguisher so it should the heavier the fire extinguisher it should not the the distance from the floor it should be lesser so in C is in no case must the clearance between the bottom of the extinguishers and the floor be less than 4 inches. So 6. The maintained in operating condition. So as what I have been saying from this topic, we should always have inspection or main maintenance. So it's a quick check that visually determined whether the fire extinguisher is properly placed and will oper operate. We need this because in case if there is a fire, we can never know, we can never tell if when a fire will occur. So we must day to day, I mean time to time, we should always inspect its availability so, so that we can assure our safety. So checkpoints during inspection should include um, the location. If it is free of, of obstruction, um, the opening instructions, the seal and tamper indications, its weight, physical appearance, pressure gog, maintenance tag. So in maintenance, extinguishers should be subjected to maintenance not more than one year apart or when specif specifically indicated by an inspection. The three basic items to be checked is its mechanical parts, extinguishing agent, and expelling means. Seventh is the operable by the area personnel who are properly trained to use them effectively and promptly. So, for example, in e if I have a building in each every floor, I should, ha I should assign um, a personnel 
in which is trained to use uh, a fire extinguisher. So, in the absence of modern fire extinguishers, the following can be used to stop fire in its initial stage. So, in class A fires, so we all know what class A fires are, right? So, these are the solid fuels, which is the wood, um, the peat. So, the best extinguisher for class A fires are water. So, be simply water. B fires, um, the best extinguisher, uh, metal cover, wet sock, towel cloth, or blanket will do. Also, sand and oil. For the class C fires, the main switch, I'm um, the best, the best extinguisher is you should the main switch is the first consideration. Pull it down to cut off the current, and what is useful on class A and B can also be useful in class C fires. So you should always first check the switch if it is turned off na. So how to use fire extinguishers? So in using fire extinguishers, we should know the PASS, pass method, the acronym PASS. So P stands for pull the pin. So as you can see in the picture, um, he just put the, his index finger in the pin. So th the pin serves as the lock for the fire extinguisher. So A stands for aim. So, in aiming a fire extinguisher, you should always aim low because, or yeah, aim low. So, after aiming low, you proceed for the S. The S means squeezing the lev lever, lever above the handle. So, we just simply squeeze it. Then, sweep from, the next, the last S should be the sweep from side to side. So, sweeping from side to side. To extinguish the fire. E. So, provide for prompt and orderly evacuation of personnel. Once a fire is discovered in a building, the first and foremost step is the prompt evacuation of all personnel to a safe place. People should be trained on orderly evacuation through fire drills. Exits that will empty the ordinary structure in an ample time to prevent loss of life or injury should be also a primary concern. So, as you notice, we have um, a yearly fire drill in our school. So, we, in case of fires, we should not always um, fight it. So, our safety should always come first. So, that's why we often practice um, exit fire drills. Because health is uh, the prim the life is the primary concern. So exit requirement for life safety in case of fire. So the building must at least have two ways out remote from each other. So additional exits according to number of persons and rel relative fire danger. So you notice in uh, school we have um, fire exits, no? We which um, we seldom only we seldom use in one okay. evacuation drills well planned frequently practiced at least twice a year so yeah that's what i've said earlier exits are well marked clear unobstructed and well lightened correct exit design regular exit drills makeshift fire escapes are often often dangerous so general fire safety precautions smoking should never be permitted in any storage area tuck room or lounge so the no smoking sign should be posted in these areas because it has a lot of flammable of substances so as what i have said earlier um the open flames are common causes of fire uh, second is exit doors should be clearly marked. Aisles should be raked or swept clean at all times. Weeds, twigs, and other trash should be kept mowed or picked up from around the outside of the building. So basically, we should um, we should maintain the cleanliness of the exit 
exit of a uh, of our fire exits. So paper storage should not be near lights, fans, and electrical boxes, heaters, or outlets because paper storage are flammable, or are fuels. I mean, flammable substances should be kept elsewhere outside the building. Vehicles and machinery should be stored in a separate building. A fire hose and buckets should be available and kept for the purpose of extinguishing Class A fires rapidly. Practice fire drills should be held so employees and boarders are familiar with their responsibilities when a real life, I mean real fire, occur. Light, lightning protection Buildings should be equipped with professionally installed lightning rods of copper or aluminum. The system should be properly grounded. All pipes, water systems, electrical systems, and telephone lines should also be grounded. Contact a professional company for proper maintenance and installation. installations. So when should we fight a fire? So in the event of a fire, your personal safety is your most important concern. You are not required to fight a fire. You're not always required to fight a fire. So if all of the following conditions are met, then you may choose to use a fire extinguisher against the fire. If any of the conditions is not met, or you have been the slightest doubt about your personal safety, do not fight the fire. So because our safety comes first. So if you think, um, don't be a hero, no? Because it sometimes causes us an accident. If you think fire is too big for you to fight, um, you should evacuate the area. So, yeah, the main point is you should not always fight a fire. Only conditions, if conditions are met, that's when we can fight a fire. Mainly, health, I mean, mainly safety first. So, what to do if caught on fire? So, if you're clothing, catches fire, we usually panic and run to the nearest shower or fire blanket. But take note, this is not the right thing to do. Running can only fan the flames and increase the potential injury. The proper thing to do is to stop, drop, and roll on the ground to extinguish the fire. So I prepared um, a one minute video. So this one minute video should maybe I one minute video. Um, wait. So here is an example of fighting a fire. I mean, in properly executing the stop, drop, and roll. So yeah, that's how you should properly do the stop, drop, and roll. So attempt to use a fire extinguisher if and only if the fire alarm has been pulled and fire department has been called. So the fire is small and contained. You know your escape route and can fight the fire with your back to the exit. 
you know what kind of extinguisher is required. The correct extinguisher is immediately at hand. You have been trained in how to use the extinguisher. So this, these are the conditions that should be met when fighting a fire. So summary and conclusions. So we should always remember the fire triangle because it properly demonstrates what elements the fire is composed of so we can prevent those elements from combining which causes fire. It also gives us idea on how fire can be extinguished. Also, we should not forget the principle of fire prevention and control programs involved in prevention, prompt action to extinguish the fire, and safe evacuation of occupants. Always put in our minds these principles. Prevent fire in your workplace, safeguard your property, and protect many lives. Thank you.